Sorayim Tovim. Nobody speaks Hebrew here? Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. And it is a great pleasure to be here in Canada with you. Um, I would like to thank New Israel Fund for offering me this opportunity to share my story uh, with you. Hopefully, um, my story will shed a light on many other stories that do not have an opportunity uh, to be heard. Um, I would also like to acknowledge how fortunate I am uh, to be here, um, to feel free and safe, to be able to be here in Canada. Uh, it is not for granted. It took me 14 years, almost half of my age, to get to this point where I feel s safe and free to travel. My story began in Darfur. My father and mother were teachers, or only teachers, at the only school in our small village in Darfur. The two of them were very engaged in improving the living conditions for our people and offering their services to our society. It is from them and their example I inherited the passion to serve the community. I didn't know that I would become the Mutasim today. The Mutasim, because I wanted, always wanted to be a medical doctor. The Mutasim of today was shaped by both my role models, father and mother, and sadly, but the genocide in Darfur. In 2003, the Sudanese government, the al-Bashir, Omar al-Bashir regime, combined with the militia called Janjaweed. They launched their deadly campaign to change the racial identity of Sudan. They started raiding the villages of African ethnic groups. They killed our people, looted our shops, and they destroyed our lives. My family displaced to one of the displaced persons camp in Darfur. They're lucky enough to have the chance to displace, unlike many other families who've lost everything. No one remained an entire family. And so I consider my family one of the luckiest to be displaced. I separated from them since I was 16. I haven't seen them until today. I moved to Khartoum, the capital city of Sudan, believing that it would be a safe place for me, but also I would not be persecuted because of my ethnicity and political opinion. And I could not have been more wrong. I applied for university to study geology. I had the chance to advocate for my family, but also for the people of Darfur. But Sudan, unlike Canada, is controlled by fear and threat, not by the rule of law. I had to go through imprisonment, pain, and torture. Now, imagine in a place like that, where no freedom of a speech, I could not go back home to Darfur. Remaining silent was not an option for me. Picking up a machine gun was not an option either. 
I didn't have any other chance other than fleeing again and seeking some safety somewhere else. And I fled to Egypt. And now, many of you may have this question, why didn't you remain or stay in Egypt and you made your way to Israel? Ladies and gentlemen, this question, or answering this question became my identity. And my answer is, Egypt, just like many other countries in the region, have shown violent intolerant towards Sudanese from Darfur, Noba Mountains, Blue Nile. These are the areas affected by genocide and ethnic cleansing. Despite the fact that we share faith, language, and perhaps borders, and yet they were on the other side to support the Sudanese government, you know, persecuting its own people. Israel, it was in 2006 when Jewish communities rallied around the world. It was in 2006 when the Holocaust Museum Yad Vashem, Jerusalem, issued a press release against the murder of our people. Despite the difference of faith, language, and we, do not, we almost don't share anything but humanity. People advocating for our people, for Darfur, to save Darfur. And that for me was a changing moment. It gave me an impression that making it to Israel, I would have a safe heaven. I fled Egypt, crossing Sinai Desert. And I entered Israel. While I was crossing, Egyptian guards were shooting from every direction. But I was lucky enough to make it safely to Israel. My struggle for rights in Israel began when I began applying for asylum. The Minister of Interior in Israel denied me this basic right. The situation in Israel became worse after arrivals of many African asylum seekers, mainly from Sudan and Eritrea, fleeing persecution and dictatorship. And this confronted with uh, lack of government responsibility and hateful incitements by Israeli elected officials. Asylum seekers are labeled as infiltrators, work infiltrators. A minister called Sudanese cancer in the body of Israeli society. Another concept member said, what if they fled persecution? Who cares? Let them go somewhere else. In 2012, they amended a law that deprived African asylum seekers from their basic rights. It was just last May when a law was enforced proclaiming that 20% of African asylum seekers' monthly income will be deposited in a private fund. It will only be returned upon decision to leave Israel. Now, imagine a family. Um, well, I have to give an example, just to understand the impact of this law on many African asylum seekers, especially families. I met a, an asylum seeker woman at the post office in Israel, Central Basis Station, just about two months ago. 
she was in her six month pregnancy. She has a five year old daughter, and her husband is in prison in a place called Saharonim in the south of Israel. I don't know the reason of his imprisonment. But she came to send him some money. Now imagine how much that asylum seeker uh, woman earns per month. 5,000 shokas, maybe 1,200 um, Canadian dollars. I guarantee you it will not be more than 1,500 Canadian dollars. 20% of that would be deducted, and now she has to take care of her husband in prison, her five-year-old daughter, and herself, the pregnant woman. This is the story of African asylum seekers right now. You know, it is so painful to hear the term illegal aliens. Beside it is inaccurate legally, but also it's not right morally, it is dehumanizing, pejorative, because it comes with so many connotations, all of them are negative, such as rapists, criminals, they destroy their lands and they're here to destroy ours. We have been there for many years, just like myself. I speak Hebrew, and sometimes I feel more comfortable speaking Hebrew than in English. We feel part of the society because I'm there. It matters to me how the Israeli society looks like. That's why I'm engaged. It is worrying and disturbing when hatred and bigotry became tools for narrow political gain. And I have to quote what Nelson Mandela said. No one is born hating another person for, his color of his, for the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than the opposite. One of the greatest things in Israel, despite the challenge and difficulties, we can still protest and speak up without fear of retribution or physically be harmed. This is something that we truly appreciate. This is something we haven't used to. We stood for our rights. Many Israelis joined our struggle, not because we are poor refugees and need a shelter, but to preserve and defend the values that the State of Israel is based on. Many Israelis supported our cause. Our struggle is far beyond the mere rights of a small community from Sudan, Eritrea, and other African countries. It's about how the Israeli society wants to look like. Whether the Israeli society should be a shared and welcoming society or intolerant and deterrent to people fleeing persecution. Do we want to see the Israeli society or the Israel as a Jewish state be a peaceful and safe place to all its inhabitants, irrespective to their religion, race, or sex? This is for you to answer. This is for the Jewish community and Israelis to answer. 
It is so fortunate to see over 1,000 African asylum seekers are relocated to Canada this year. 1,000 African asylum seekers relocated to Canada. They can finally feel safety and freedom. But for me, it's also unfortunate that Israel does not have a place for people fleeing persecution and terrible atrocities from Sudan, Darfur, Eritrea, Nova Mountains, and other countries, of course. Israel has a capacity to take refugees. Yes, politicians view refugees and asylum seekers as a threat to Jewish state. They spew hatred, mongering propaganda that uh, unfairly blamed refugees for every problem in South Tel Aviv. For instance, in Petah Tikva, one of the neighborhoods near Tel Aviv, the mayor decided to cut electricity and gas from the apartments rented by African asylum seekers. And we say we fled persecution. We were threatened. And we cannot pose and will not pose a threat to Israelis because we have been there. We know what it feels. This year, we have about 21 African asylum seekers who are in Israeli universities. They're able to study because they're great people supporting Israelis, Jewish people supporting the African asylum seekers. They struggle every month to renew their visas, not to be sent to a detention facility named Holod in the Negev Desert. Every month, they have to go to Ministry of Interior to make sure that they're not sent to a detention facility designed specifically for Sudanese and Eritreans to make their life miserable. This year is my last year of finishing my law school. I have the chance to become a lawyer in Israel. These are opportunities that I'm talking about. We can be good ambassadors to Israel. We have the drive, we have the passion to do good. We will be an added value to Israel. Just, my, just like my journey made me so sensitive to others' pain and suffering, I also want to call you to be there for those less fortunate, those are still under persecution, those are still persecuted because of who they are, not because of their actions. Because that's what we should stand for. As Albert Einstein said, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those watching them without doing anything. Let's all pray for those still in the darkness of tyranny may someday see the light of freedom. May someday brighter day come. Thank you so much. Thank you.